welcome to Earth Science Resources. Today we're speaking with Dr. Tian Yi Soon. She is a climate scientist. Well, my name is Tian Yi Soon. I am a climate scientist at Environmental Defense Fund. I joined the EDF uh, in 2019 uh, in December, uh, actually in September, um, after I got my PhD at University of Texas at Austin in climate dynamics. I joined as a postdoctoral uh, scientist for two years. And after that two years, I decided to stay on as a climate scientist at EDF. So as a scientist in an advocacy organization, we spend, well, I personally spend about half of my time doing original research. So these are policy relevant science that look similar to uh, academic research, but just with some kind of um, policy angle to it. For example, the past couple of years, I've been working on how methane emissions and methane mitigations would impact the climate. Um, I was thinking about how much it changes the temperature, how much it will influence things like ocean warming, um, sea ice loss, um, sea level rise, and things like that. So these are research that um, would help us to advocate for more em emission reduction in methane, for example. And I spend the, the other half of my time doing um, scientific communications or vetting materials from other teams at EDF that are related to climate science. Um, my job is to make sure that those information are scientifically accurate, whether that is a public facing document, a blog post, a um, press release, a, a, tw a tweet thread, um, or that might be something that we send uh, to EDF members or EDF founders to communicate a certain topic. I just wanted to make sure those are on par with the latest understanding of um, that topic on climate science. So the uh, specifically the research I've worked on is um, how much methane mitigation can help us preserve Arctic summer sea ice, how much uh, reducing methane emissions with all the strategies that are already available today can lower the risk of uh, having ice free Arctic summers. So this is a research that will be published actually mid-March. So it's something that I'm ready to share. Um, so the other research that I've worked on is about net zero emission pathways. So as you know, net zero has been a very, very powerful and popular concept in the policy discussions and among businesses, um, that this is something that we need to do in order, in order to stabilize the climate and not warm, quote unquote, too much. And, you know, uh, carbon dioxide emissions have been the focus of net zero goals and targets or commitments, however you call it. But methane emissions have been a little bit overlooked in that concept. So we actually published a paper earlier last year, just talk about what how does methane play a role in net zero pathways, how it influences the near-term temperature, how it influence, may influence the long-term temperature, and how um, you know, there are multiple pathways we can get to net zero, but the one that we uh, choose to act on methane right now and quickly would have benefit the climate over the next few decades and also the long-term. So that is, an, an example of what kind of research I would work on. Um, you know, data from a data analysis point, uh, it looks like sometimes playing with data in Excel, as simple as that, uh, I may be gathering different data sources and trying to figure out exactly how much methane emissions are being put into the atmosphere today, how much is projected into the future. Um, it can also look like coding in Python is what the language I use right now to produce a figure that um, shows different climate outputs, climate model outputs of temperature um, and you know things like that. 
I've heard a lot of people talking about their careers and there was this moment where they figure out, oh, that is what I'm passionate about. I don't think there was a particular moment for me as a kid. I was just really fascinated by natural sciences, all kinds of natural science, not limited to earth science slash geology or slash geoscience or anything like that. Um, there were some moments where my uh, playground in my school is half raining and half sunny. I was like, oh, that is really interesting. So that might maybe the first uh, few sparks that I got really interested in meteorology. And there was a um, really bad flood um, in China where I grew up in uh, northeastern China, actually. Around twenty, uh, around 1997, 98, and my dad, at the time, he was working for an electricity company, and he couldn't come home for a few days because he had to be in the front line and figure out how to repair electricity um, networks and make sure that all the residents in our area has electricity. So that was, you know, uh, sort of realizing the power of nature, the power of rain and water and things like that. So I think I was just always a little bit fascinated by these natural um, phenomena. And in before from there, from there all the way to thinking about going into college, I you know I didn't really focus on a particular path. We had geography classes where we learn about the wind belt uh, around the earth, how uh, the rotation kind of creates that. And it's all very fascinating to me. For a while, I was really interested in biology, actually. I was surprised I didn't pursue that. Um, but, you know, the college entrance process in China doesn't give the students a lot of freedom to think about what exactly they are curious about or passionate about. It's more about getting good grades and trying to get into a good university. So that was my goal as well. I mainly just focused on study, study, study and get good grades. And when I was about to choose a major, um, atmospheric science just kind of stood out as a choice that uh, is the most balanced that I was able to study something I, I'm curious about. It's part of the natural science world, but also that would allow me to enter into a good university, which is Nanjing University and end up getting into. So there is a little bit of just strategy of um, um, sort of laying a good foundation for, the, for my future career. And for the four years in Nanjing University, I studied atmospheric sciences and Interestingly, I actually learned about the 1998 floods was caused by this phenomenon called El Nino sudden oscillation. And this is a warming and cooling anomaly in the center and the eastern of the tropic Pacific Ocean, which is so far away from my hometown. And that was really fascinating. I didn't know something that happens in the middle of the ocean could give us flooding in that little, you know, teeny part of the world. So I think that sort of connected back to the childhood curiosity for meteorology and things like that. So I just stick to it. I, I really liked it. And from there, I applied for grad school um, in the U.S. I moved to the U.S. in 2014 and joined the a geoscience department at UT and studied climate dynamics for the next five years. It's a great question. It's a loaded question. I, there, there isn't anything specifically I would do differently, but I wish I knew a little bit more about how a scientist can contribute to society besides being an academic. During the four and a half years out of five years of my PhD, I was thinking about um, tenure track positions, being a professor, teaching, doing scientific research for the rest of my life. Um, I didn't really pay attention to the other opportunities that might be out there. I didn't think about scientific advocacy. I didn't you know, honestly, I didn't even think about climate change solutions that much because I was so focused on my own little niche 
So I think I wish the younger self seeked out that question more. I, I wish I would have asked the question, are there any other ways? And, you know, in the rest, uh, in the last half of year of my PhD, I sort of uh, finally realized that I will have to move my geographic locations maybe multiple times, very likely multiple times to pursue a tenure track position. And I would have to yeah, write grants and um, you know, to do a lot of proposing. <laughs> and that's not necessarily something that I'm passionate about. I love teaching. I love doing research, but I don't particularly enjoy writing a proposal and trying to get funding for it. So that's when I started to think about other opportunities and kind of stumbled into the ad for the postdoc fellowship at EDF and finally knew that there are other roles out there. And then during the two years at EDF, I started learning about all kinds of other ways that scientists can contribute to the world without being necessarily acad academic. Um, so I wish that was something that I realized early on and could have maybe reached out to more people to learn about their careers and just open my own mind a bit more. It, it was very stressful to trying to figure out what the next step is during the PhD um, period. Um, so I think if I had a little bit more information, it would have been a little bit easier. Um, I think another thing that I would like to know or kind of tell my younger self is I thought stepping out of academia was such a big deal. I thought I would never be able to go back. I would kind of stop publishing and not, you know, quote unquote, be a scientist anymore. But it turned out so good, I could still do the original science, but now I get to promote my science and use my research to for climate advocacy, to uh, use my communication skills, to uh, talk to high school students and college students about the science. And um, I think I started to realize that that wasn't that big of a change I thought it was. And also it is not a permanent change that I couldn't change in the future anymore. So that thing that seems so such a huge step in, during, in the last year of my PhD, now I look back and I know I can pivot my career anytime that I want to for it to fit my own interest and you know the things I care about and also the the skills that I have so I, I wish that was something that I realized and be less anxious about